Next, I would love to welcome Dr. Jennifer Litton from UT MD Anderson Cancer Center, and she will be a discussant on the prior abstract that was presented. So thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to discuss pregnancy after breast cancer, and specifically this very exciting positive study. So fertility for our young breast cancer patients is such an important concern. And in fact, I have multiple patients that tell me it's one of their biggest treatment regrets because they didn't discuss it up front. Here we see data from both 2004 and then updated 2014 showing that we're still not doing what we should be doing with discussing fertility concerns with our young cancer patients. And for those that we do, we're still leaving them with many questions. You know, one of the first questions that we often get asked when, when a patient is considering having a subsequent pregnancy after a diagnosis is when is the best time? And the data that we have, we have to really look at some of these older retrospective studies, and we get some hints. Some of the earlier ones suggest that the farther away you are from your uh, diagnosis and treatment, the decreased chance you have of dying of your breast cancer. And maybe if two years is better, maybe four years is better. And I think the updated meta-analysis from 2021 um, suggests that that still is in place, but not different by time of diagnosis. But what about planning pregnancy by subtype. So for our patients with hormone receptor negative breast cancer, this isn't as much of a problem when we're suggesting patients to wait 18 months or two years. Because at that time, no further systemic therapy is indicated at that time during that period. But what about our patients with hormone receptor positive breast cancer? Endocrine therapy recommended five and now 10 years during the time that this uh, trial was ongoing, and that delays a future pregnancy. Tamoxifen is contraindicated during pregnancy due to the high risk of birth defects associated with it. And these women are often ones that can decide to either not take endocrine therapy at all and delay it to try to have a pregnancy, or as we saw in the positive trial, start endocrine therapy for a period of time and then hold it, have a pregnancy, and then resume it and complete it. We have some hints of some data of some intermittent endocrine therapy exist of benefits of resumption of endocrine therapy as, as well as taking it intermittently, but I would caution this is also in a very different population than we're studying in positive. Now those five or 10 years of adjuvant endocrine therapy, especially for women in their late 30s, can really take pregnancy as an option off the table for many of our patients. And it's not just that when you receive chemotherapy that you may go into premature menopause, but we also know that even if you don't go into premature menopause, we can shift your natural age of menopause to an earlier time. And lastly, a very important question that our patients ask us is what about our overall survival? So I've put up side by side two meta-analysis, the first from 2011, the second updated and expanded as more data became available. But this is the data that was available at the time when the positive trial was being designed and showing that patients who went on to have a subsequent pregnancy when compared to patients who did not for breast cancer patients had a pooled relative risk of 0.59. And I pulled one of the tables uh, from the 2021 as well, showing a very still similar result of 0.53. So that brings us to the positive trial. And as Dr. Partridge has gone through the eligibility, I think it's really important to notice one of the biggest standouts of the positive is 
these all women in this cohort wish to become pregnant. Women who are under 42 years old, at least 18 months, um, and then up to 30 months, and could have had any chemotherapy, adjuvant, neoadjuvant, and fertility preservation. I think the three-month washout for this trial was very reasonable given the half-life of tamoxifen, the metabolites, and it's probably out of your system by about two months and the additional month for safety. And as Dr. Partridge showed, here are the positive trial results in this first look compared to the soft in text, where we're really seeing these curves to be almost superimposed for breast cancer-free interval as well as distant recurrence-free interval. I think it's very important to highlight who participated in positive, though. The biggest portion of patients at 43% were aged 35 to 39. This is really important when you're thinking about adding 10 years of endocrine therapy, three quarters of whom had not had a prior birth, and 94% stage one and two. And here's the 18-month landmark analysis that Dr. Partridge showed. Again, I think very intriguing and interesting um, and I find it also interesting, and I am not in any way comparing the two, but I do find it very interesting that uh, as we pull up that same meta-analysis, we're seeing um, hazard ratios that are similar, and I think it'll just be interesting to follow as this data matures. As far as pregnancy status and therapy resumption, 74% of the patients became pregnant 86% had a live birth, 15 sets of twins, 110 had more than one pregnancy. When we look at birth defects at 2%, that is a not above what we would expect in the general population. There were both spontaneous and therapeutic abortions in 109 women. Now when we look at the curve of 76% of patients resuming the endocrine therapy, 8% uh, had died uh, prior to the resumption of endocrine therapy, and 15% were still either in the process of trying to get pregnant or postpartum or um, breastfeeding. And I think that's also interesting to put in context of what we saw from both soft techs as well as the adjuvant aromatase inhibitor trials where we had patient drop off in the 20% range. So there's multiple strengths and weaknesses, though I think I should have renamed this limitations more so than weaknesses. But first, as a strength, it's the first prospective study to tackle a really difficult question. It's been an incredible international co collaboration. And this gives us really a first look into the safety of a practice that was already happening. So. I think they have a good follow-up in offspring, reproductive technologies, and uh, long-term survival. So as far as the weaknesses, yes, it is a single-arm study compared to a historical control with this 18 to 30-month window. But this is a very important question that can never be studied in a randomized controlled trial. And so I would congratulate the investigators on really looking at different clinical trial designs and looking at different cohorts to go to questions that are really important. They'll need to continue to follow the long-term resumption, the length of the endocrine therapy, and of course, the uh, uh, longer follow-up for hormone receptor positive survival endpoints. I also think this brings us back to our first slide on how we can better provide this information to our patients. Over the last 15 years, we've had multiple guidelines, multiple data sets, and decision aids. But we're still left with very wide risk estimates that often don't individually account for ovarian reserve measures, comorbidities, and personal fertility history. I do think it's time for us to take the next steps to start to consider artificial intent. Uh, intelligence to better identify and individualize who's at risk, in addition with our electronic medical records. We have the data sets now, not only to build and to train, but to truly validate such a tool. And also very important to include our reproductive colleagues as part of our care team. 
So in conclusion, congratulations. This was a challenging study to design and, and execute. It adds to the existing uh, data of safety of subsequent pregnancies after a diagnosis of breast cancer. But I would still say that this is an exceptionally individual decision. I don't think positive or these results should be widely interpreted across all patients who are premenopausal with early breast cancer yet need to take into account uh, the age and their personal risk of recurrence. This is completely not uh, looked at by positive, but I think important to state when we're looking now at patients with high risk um, therapies requiring adjuvant abemaciclib. This is someone I would not hold for this or delay the abemaciclib, and that should be fully completed. I think these early results are promising. However, given the nature of hormone receptor positive disease, longer follow-up is necessary, and we need to continue to improve discussing fertility concerns with our breast cancer patients who want future pregnancies. We, this is the time for better assessment tools and implementation tools. So with that, I'd like to thank the patients and the families who participated in this very important first perspective studies to the authors and study teams across the world.